Washington DC's King of Crack will be released from prison. At the age of 24, Rayful Edmonds was looking at spending the rest of his life in a federal prison somewhere. Concrete and steel, loneliness, depression. It was all in his future. After all, he was the King of Crack in Washington DC. Prosecutors said that Edmonds organization employed over 150 people. And in the wake of his crack sales, that organization committed at least 30 murders. If you knew Rayful outside of the dirty part of drug dealing, many people said you would find him to be a likable guy, good looking with a good personality. Most people around him never knew that he was running a crack empire that was destroying the chocolate city. You see, Rayful loved basketball and he enjoyed playing the game. He would sit courtside at Georgetown Koya games and struck up friendships with basketball great Alonzo Mourning and other basketball stars, John Turner. John Thompson, the coach, had gotten word that Rafel was the king of crack and sent word that he wanted to talk to him. In no uncertain terms, the coach told Rafel to fall back from, from hanging out with his players. He threatened that if Rafel did not do so, there would be serious consequences, according to some. Rafel fell back, but his world would soon come crashing down on him, like the Great Walls of Jericho. On April 15, 1989, he would be arrested and charged by the feds. There was a long list of violations continuing a criminal enterprise, conspiracy to distribute cocaine and crack. Things were not looking good for Rayful. The government alleged in court documents that Edmonds, along with Dwayne DC Scorpio, was said to have brought between one to 2,000 kilos of cocaine per week in 1992 from the Trujillo Blanco brothers, who were associated with the Medellin cartel and sold the drugs to Washington area wholesalers. Edmonds estimated revenue was approximately 300 million annually. He was known to have spent $457,619 in an exclusive Georgetown store, Lene Petit specializing in Italian men's clothing, owned by Charles Wynn, who was later convicted on 34 counts of money laundering. A trial ensued and Rafel found himself on the losing end. On September 17, 1990, the district court imposed sentences of mandatory life without parole on count one, life without parole on counts two and five, 60 months on count 11, and 48 months on count 14, 15, 16, and 18. Edmund's sentences were to run concurrently. At 24 years old, Rafel's young life would be stamped out in a federal courthouse. The Chocolate City was burying their biggest drug dealer alive. This was it. Or was it? Rafel was not the only one to feel the trauma. The feds also sentenced his mother, Constance Bootsy Perry, to 14 years in prison for being part of the enterprise. Rafel would later win two separate appeals, but the sentence of life would always remain intact. Or would it? With a life sentence, what would Rafel do? He would go on to sell drugs from prison. Of course, even the penitentiary could not stop him from doing what he wanted to do. Life as he knew it was over, so why not keep getting money? While in Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary in Pennsylvania, he became the man. He would hook up with Dixon Dario and Osvaldo Chiqui Trejillo Blanco, son of Griselda, godmother Trejillo Blanco, who shared the same cell block with him. Edmonds was setting up deals between D.C. area traffickers and his Colombian connection while incarcerated. In 1996, Edmond and another drug dealer from Atlanta named Lowe were convicted after conducting drug business from a federal prison phone. Edmund received an additional 30-year sentence in the great state of Pennsylvania. In an interview with the Bureau of Prisons, Edmund said he had spent several hours every day on the telephone, occasionally using two lines simultaneously to conduct his drug business. Attorney General Eric Holder criticized the Federal Bureau of Prisons for its lax management that allowed drug dealers to deal drugs from inside the prison. With life plus 30 years, Rafel said he wanted out, and there was only one way to make that happen. He had to work for the feds. And in 1996, federal authorities had revealed that Edmund had become a government informant. This was in the making long before the drug dealing in Lewisburg, though. You see, in 1994, law enforcement officials approached Mr. Edmund about cooperating with the government, and he orally agreed to do so. Mr. Edmund executed a written agreement to cooperate in early 1995 with the former United States Attorney and former Attorney General, Eric Holder, the same man who criticized the Bureau of Prisons. 
Mr. Edmond agreed to offer substantial assistance while incarcerated at USP Lewisburg, a maximum security institution with inmates who were among the most dangerous recidivists in the nation at the time. A federal prison that was rife with violence and murder. A bold move for him, because had the DC car found out this information, he would have been killed. And despite imminent danger, Mr. Edmond agreed to cooperate. This cooperation was supposed to only benefit his mother. According to court documents, Mr. Edmond acknowledged that his substantial assistance would not result in the filing of a Rule 35B motion on his behalf. In other words, Mr. Edmond's cooperation solely benefited Ms. Perry, his mother, as the third party beneficiary of the plea agreement. And Ms. Perry would receive a sentence reduction based on Mr. Edmond's substantial assistance as prescribed in the government's Rule 35B motion in Ms. Perry's case. Her original sentence of 293 months in her 24.42 years was reduced to 14 years based on resentencing hearings for legal mistakes. Rayful's mom was originally sentenced to 24 years. Could you imagine your mother going down for 24 years for the crimes that you committed? Would you involve your mom in your cocaine and crack conspiracy? Some people do. But based on Rayful's cooperation, Judge Penn would on June 2nd, 1998, Resenting Miss Perry to time served. You see, Rafel wanted to save his mother as she had had enough of prison. This is what he wanted to do. He wanted mama to go home. Rafel had freed his mother. Everybody was fair game and Rafel would help with 20 homicides that law enforcement wanted to solve. 20 homicides. But would he ever be released? He already had three separate first degree murder charges dismissed. Now what did he have to do? He had to find a way out. You see, Rafel was playing a dirty game that could have cost him his life. He was selling drugs from the penitentiary, all while working for the government. He agreed to work with the government in a covert drug investigation commencing in August 1994. Next, Mr. Edmund testified as a government witness in two criminal trials in the Middle District of Pennsylvania. In the first trial, his testimony contributed to at least two of his fellow inmates, Freddy Aguilera and Nelson Garcia, being convicted and sentenced to life in prison for agreeing to ship cocaine from Columbia to Mr. Edmonds' associates in the district. And two, in the second trial, his testimony over the course of eight days led to the convictions of two individuals, Michael A. Jackson, not the singer, and James Marshall Corbin. If Rafel wanted his freedom someday, the government wanted more. They wanted blood. Mr. Edmond would then participate in the reverse undercover sting of DC drug dealers who had been the recipients of cocaine shipped at his behest to them in 1992 from the Trejillo Blanco Colombian cartel family. In August 1996, Mr. Edmund invited those targets to purchase cocaine from a shipment that would be delivered to the district and the undercover operation led to the seizure of $190,000 in drug proceeds. From the penitentiary, he was directing and working. In April 1997, Judge Thomas F. Hogan accepted Mr. Edmonds' testimony that resolved the dispute regarding the 1992 drug conduct of two co-conspirators, and his testimony was corroborated by wiretap evidence. In the end, the undercover operation led to the convictions of eight defendants. Rodney Murphy, Jimmy Robinson, LeCount Jackson, Adolf Jackson, Daryl Coles, Marcus Haynes, Johnny Cherry, and Christopher Johnson. Still, the government had not gotten enough. They had not gotten enough. They wanted more and more was to come. Mr. Edmond provided the field office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania with information regarding two homicides that were committed at USP Lewisburg in 1994. And Mr. Edmond was expected to testify as a government witness at the trials for both homicides. Also, the government indicated that Mr. Edmond was willing to provide testimony in the fall of 1997 with the approval of the Deputy Attorney General of the United States, the various congressional oversight committees that were investigating issues involving drug trafficking and prison reform. In this new motion to finally collect on his cooperation, the government summarized Mr. Edmonds' cooperation as follows. Mr. Edmonds' assistance to law enforcement has proven to be very substantial and has directly led to numerous convictions of major national and international drug traffickers. In addition, Mr. Edmond has provided law enforcement with information that may help the Bureau of Prisons reconsider policies regarding privileges 
ran into maximum security federal inmates that are inconsistent with the Bureau of Prisons' mission to incapacitate certain prisoners. Finally, Mr. Edmonds' cooperation in the attendant publicity may have helped rectify serious social problems in D.C. by demoralizing other drug dealers. His cooperation has also helped to dispel his legendary image among the drug culture and now serves to discourage others from imitating his conduct as a drug kingpin. Here, Rafel wanted to make sure that certain privileges are limited for those in maximum security prisons. Did he want to contribute to the suffering of maximum security prisoners? You decide. Ravel's agreement called for him in 2002 to testify as a government witness for approximately four days in the trial of six defendants. In United States versus Kevin Gray, prior to his arrest in 1989, Mr. Edmund had conducted drug transactions with many of the defendants in that case, according to his testimony. As noted by the government, the Gray racketeering drug enterprise covered criminal activity spanning more than a decade and was perhaps the most violent drug trafficking group ever prosecuted in this district. According to prosecutors, Kevin Gray and his crew were, were responsible for over 30 homicides in the D.C. area. Mr. Edmonds' testimony led to the convictions of all six defendants for RICO conspiracy and related charges in connection with multiple first-degree murders and drug offenses. In 2003, Mr. Edmonds testified as a government witness in a trial concerning drug trafficking in the Western District of North Carolina. In addition, Mr. Edmund was prepared to testify in a second case in this district, but the case was resolved via guilty plea, in part due to Mr. Edmund's cooperation. Mr. Edmund has supplied background and associational information that has been used in drug trafficking investigations. In particular, his information has been used in numerous wiretap investigations. Noting that Mr. Edmund's information was not the sole basis for the wiretaps in any of these investigations, but very useful. The government asserts that based in part on Mr. Edmonds' assistance in this regard, over 100 drug dealers were arrested, prosecuted, and convicted. The government averts that the information for Mr. Edmonds and others was used to obtain wiretaps and narcotic investigations in 12 different matters. In the first matter, the wiretap led to 39 indictments involving 65 defendants. The wiretap in the second matter led to five indictments involving 14 defendants. In the third matter, the wiretap led to one indictment involving 22 defendants. The wiretap in the fourth matter led to one indictment involving 14 defendants. In the fifth matter, the wiretap led to three indictments involving 77 defendants. The wiretap in the sixth matter led to 15 indictments involving 29 defendants. In the seventh matter, the wiretap led to four indictments involving 36 defendants. The wiretap in the eighth matter led to five indictments involving five defendants. And there were many, many more. Many, many, many more. Mr. Edmund has provided information to local law enforcement investigating cold case homicides, Judge, including a significant amount of information concerning relevant relationships. Mr. Edmund participated in monthly telephone calls with the AUSA John Dominguez, who relayed questions from law enforcement which allowed them to collect information about relationships between the descendants and suspects not otherwise known to the investigators. Mr. Edmund has often been able to provide information to investigators regarding friendships, rivalries, or feuds among descendants and suspects. Mr. Edmund's information assisted law enforcement with focusing its attention on others once learning that a suspect had a motive to commit murder, even when those murders occur after the defendant has been incarcerated. You know, Judge, in moving for this reduction of sentence, the government notes that none of Mr. Edmund's information about cold cases led directly to arrests. But the information helped homicide detectives focus limited resources by relating historical information about which drug dealer was allied with whom and which dealer was arguing with another dealer. Mr. Edmonds' information contributed to the local cold case squad solving old homicides in the District of Columbia. On February 23, 2021, Judge Emmett Sullivan, a D.C. native, appointed by none other than President George H.W. Bush, decided that Rayful should not die in prison. The government, 30 years after Rafel's conviction, filed a motion asking the court to reduce the sentence under what is called a Rule 35 motion for substantial assistance. The judge ordered a hearing and the United States attorney would testify on behalf of Rafel, telling the judge that despite the bodies that were left in the streets of DC and the crack that played in the city's downfall, he was a changed man. A changed man that deserved a second chance to reclaim his life. Despite saying that Rafel was a changed man, 
The government wanted the court to impose a 40-year term. Rayful was dealing with the devil. But it's always that way when you want your freedom. When the government was looking for a life sentence, they would tell the court, between 1985, Judge, and 1989, Mr. Edmond led a large-scale cocaine distribution conspiracy. Mr. Edmond's operation generated millions of dollars from the wholesale and retail distribution of cocaine and crack cocaine. This court should know that Mr. Edmond and his associates were unscrupulous in their pursuit of cold cash and their collection of valuable items, including expensive cars, $1,000 shirts, gold medallions worth $60,000, diamond encrusted Rolex watches, swimming pools, hundreds of tennis shoes, and wads of $100, bill, $100 bills. You see, Judge, this defendant should die in prison. And the government painted the picture that Rafel was the worst of the worst that society had within it. And the court would then impose that life sentence. But the government's position would later change when he agreed to help the government. Rafel would argue that the 40 years that the government was asking for was far too much time. He had to sit at the table and wonder, these were my friends and now they want 40 years. I thought they were going to release me. Rafel would ask the judge for 15 years. He would cite his substantial assistance and the need to avoid unwarranted sentencing disparities. Then the judge in response would say, what troubles the court deeply, however, is that Mr. Edmund stands convicted of having run the largest cocaine distribution operation in the history of the nation's capital. Although there are no statutorily defined victims in this case, it is beyond dispute that Mr. Edmund's involvement in the criminal enterprise damaged this community deeply and resulted in the destruction of the lives of many individuals. While this might be shocking to the average citizen, the judge said in reducing Mr. Edmund's case and reducing his sentence, that no matter how horrible an offender's crimes, how unlikely his prospect of rehabilitation, how dangerous he might be, an informer deserves a reward for the benefit conferred on society by his assistance in investigating and prosecuting wrongdoers. He even quoted a case from the Southern District of New York that was issued in December 6, 2006, United States versus Torres Tire. To reward Mr. Edmund for his cooperation, the government moved to reduce his sentence in this case. When the dust settled, Judge Emmett G. Sullivan did not hand down the 40-year sentence that the government wanted for the changed and reformed man. Instead, Judge Sullivan reduced the sentence to 20 years. But Rafel would not be freed, not yet anyway. He still had the 30 years in Pennsylvania to contend with. But just yesterday, on November 8th, Judge Matthew Brand reduced that 30-year sentence to 24 years. His total sentence with both cases would be 44 years, and with good time, Rayful Edmonds, the king of crack, could be released in less than two and a half years. He could be in a community near you. Is he reformed? Did he deserve his freedom? Only you can decide. So here you go, man, 24 years old, sentenced to life. Can you imagine that? No matter what he did, all the things that he did, He's still going to spend 35 years of his life in prison. He thought he was living his best life. Had all the women, all the cars, $60,000 watches, all the cars he wanted to drive, all the women that he wanted to spend the night with. And at the end of the day, his mother gets sentenced to 24 years in federal prison. He gets sentenced to life. His mother spends about, what, 11 years altogether in prison. He's going to spend 35 years of his life in prison. All the best years of his life are forever gone. You have to be thinking right now, all the money in the world, it's not worth your life. It's not worth your life, man. You know, a little bit of good time that he had, was it worth 35 years of misery, 35 years of pain? These people will put your lights out and they will work you like a dog. And in the end, they'll just ball you up, throw you away. Ask yourself, man. You're out there getting money, out there doing the wrong things. Look in the mirror and just ask yourself, say, man, what am I worth? What am I worth? How valuable is your freedom? That's the moral of the story, man. How valuable is your freedom? Blood on the Razor Wire TV until tomorrow. We're out.